All right, well, thank you for uh, being part of this class. This is the first lesson in the um, series, The Life of Jesus in Chronological, in chronological Order. You know, one of the more uh, popular uh, form of books has been uh, the biography formula, where we tell the story of a person uh, of their life, beginning with uh, their early life all the way uh, till the time of their death. And we love to read about the intimate details and the early lives of the you know, rich people and famous people, or those who have made uh, perhaps significant contributions to, uh, to our society. Uh, it seems that by reading about their lives, we, we measure our own lives. A lot of times we're inspired to change or to try things because we've seen the example of another person by reading about their, about their lives. Biographies also give us insights into the, the forces and events that uh, shape the person and they help us to understand the world of the past and how these influences shape our own lives today, all by reading about the life of an individual in the context of their history and their society. So it would seem natural then that the studying of the life of Jesus would benefit us in all of these ways and also help establish um, a true standard for living since we're, we're looking at the life of not just anyone, but we're looking at the life of the, um, the Son of God. Now usually when we study the Gospels, we're looking at the teachings of Jesus and what they mean. We're looking at you know, how we can apply these things uh, to our lives. We rarely study Jesus Himself. Uh, in other words, we, we rarely study His life in the order that He actually lived it because we, we're reading through the Gospels and the Gospels, each writer is emphasizing different uh, moments at different times and they're not always in the same uh, sequence. Now the reason for this, as I said, is because the gospel writers each record a variety of incidents in Jesus' life, sometimes not recorded by the other writers. So when you read the four gospels, uh, one after another, you're not always sure how the events flow. I mean, in general, they, they, they flow you know, from beginning to end, but you're not sure which event happened at what, at what time. They each uh, tell the story from his birth to his death, but the details in between are not always explained in chronological order, so you can get a, a sense of how one event naturally leads into another event. So this class will have several objectives. First of all, uh, I'll present to you the life of Jesus in chronological order. In other words, what he did and where he went from the first to the last in a step-by-step -step direction. Secondly, we're going to help you prepare a notebook where you will have, among other things, the event in Jesus' life listed in order. Event number one, event number two, all the way down to the final events of his death and his resurrection and his ascension. You'll also have parallel scriptural references for these events also listed in chronological, uh, chronological order. When I say um, uh, a scripture references, I'm going to also give you um, the event and then which of the four gospel writers talks about the event and the particular scripture reference for that event. So for this, I, I'd ask you to get a, a notebook, preferably one that will hold an eight and a half by 11 uh, paper. Your notes will look uh, a little bit like what you see here in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the overhead uh, that's above. You'll have a number and then you'll have the event and the comment and then you'll have all the references in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So by the end of this course you'll have a notebook with a complete biography of Jesus' life, His ministry, His miracles, the passion, all of it listed in chronological order. Now you don't have to take notes obviously but uh, if you're going to take the course, it would be handy if you uh, took these notes because by the end of the course, you'll have all of this information uh, in chronological order and you can use it for class or for personal study. I think it's a very handy thing to have. Okay, thirdly, um, I will select certain events to explain and enlarge upon, or you may stop and ask any question about an event or teaching uh, for, class, uh, uh, for class discussion. Um, you know, we're going to stop sometimes at some events uh, because sometimes you know, we say to ourselves, you know, I've always wondered about such and such. 
about a certain event, why he did this, or how this is connected to that. So hopefully by discussing the various events, giving you some insights, you'll understand some of the reasoning behind what uh, Jesus did. And I also find one thing about this course that's very handy, and that is when you know how one event leads into another event, it kind of gives you perspective. You know? It gives you a real perspective on uh, the activity of Jesus' ministry. Now, if we move quickly, uh, we'll be through in, in one quarter. Uh, but if our class begins to have a lot of questions and discussion, maybe we'll have to lengthen it. But our goal is to finish it in 13 lessons. So since most of you don't have notebooks at the moment, I'm going to start with an overview of Jesus' ministry with a handout that you can put into your notes. So we're going to move on to uh, some, um, uh, some of the larger events, uh, the, um, the, the, the kind of overview of His, of his ministry. Now when Jesus was born, <clears throat> the world kept time according to the Roman calendar. Give you a, there we go. Now the Roman calendar was based on the year that the city of Rome was founded. Now I'm going to talk about this because before we start with the events, we have to kind of put into context the time frame when Jesus lived here on this earth. So we're going to talk about the calendar. So when he was born, the world you know, had a Roman calendar, and this Roman calendar was based on the year that the city of Rome was founded. With this calculation, Jesus was born in the year 735, because the city of Rome was said to have been founded 735 years previous to the year of His birth. So if we kept with it, we'd be in the year 2746 Roman time, as of the year that we're actually making this class. Uh, in addition to this, some people uh, of that era kept time according to the years that a certain king or an emperor uh, was in power. In Luke chapter 3, verse 1, uh, it says that John's ministry is said to begin in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So they had different ways of pinpointing the accurate time. The Roman calendar, how many years since the a city of Rome was founded for the specific time, what year in the reign of, of, of a king, for example. So this, uh, this particular calendar uh, was used and continued to be used even past uh, Jesus' life. In the Middle Ages, the Christian calendar was introduced using the birth of Jesus as the zero point. When calculations were made and calendars were produced and distributed, it was noted that there was an error that was made and the birth of Jesus was actually four years prior to the zero date that had previously been calculated. And so there was a problem here. You know, they, 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 because you know, Christianity was the dominant religion at that time, they figured, well, let's get rid of this Roman calendar. Roman calendar is based on you know, paganism, the city of Rome, and so on and so forth. Let's have a Christian calendar. And instead of the zero point being the, 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 the founding of the city of Rome, let's, let's have the zero point be the birth of, of Jesus. And so they, they did this and they announced it throughout the, uh, Europe and so on and so forth. And they had the calendars made and the calendars were dis, uh, distributed and everybody was working with that. And then they discovered that they had made a mistake in their calculations. And the true year of Jesus' birth was not that zero point that they had established, but was actually four years before that zero point. And so even after the mistake was noticed, they figured, well, it's too late now. We'll just have to go with what we have. This is how it came to be that when pinpointing the calendar date of Jesus' birth, scholars tell us that He was born in 4 BC. If you've ever read some scholarly material about the birth of Jesus, they'll say Jesus was born four years before Jesus was born. So it doesn't make any sense, but that historical note helps you to understand why they say this is, uh, this is the year of His birth. Now we also know that He died when He was 33. Luke chapter 3 verse 23 says He was 30 years of age when He began His ministry. And then when you review His ministry event by event, you see that he lived through three annual Passover celebrations and he died during the celebration of the fourth. 
So if he was born around 4 BC and he died at 33 years of age, it means the calendar date of his death is approximately 29 AD. And so Pentecost happened in 29 AD. You know, uh, those churches whose uh, cornerstone, you see those churches, you go by a church and it has a cornerstone in its building and it says this church established in 33 AD. I, I agree with the, the spirit and the, you know, the doctrine of that you know, because the church was established you know, uh, on Pentecost Sunday after Jesus' birth and so on and so forth. Uh, but 33 AD is not uh, the correct date. The correct date would be 29 AD. So even by New Testament standards, 33 was still a, a young age to die. The normal lifespan at that time was about 50 to 55 years of age. Today, a normal lifespan, a man maybe perhaps 79, 80 years of age, a woman uh, three or four years older. But in those days, lifespan was much shorter, 50 to 55. But even taking that into consideration, uh, dying at 33 was still relatively young. Okay, so that's a little bit of history about the date, you know, if there was ever any confusion about the date when you read about Jesus being born 4 BC, that kind of explains uh, why it is in that way. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, change gears here and talk about <clears throat> the seven periods of Jesus' life. Now we're going to break that down, those seven periods, I'm going to break that down into uh, individual events starting in our next lesson, but for today, we're going to look simply at the seven periods. So period number one, uh, there we go. I showed you the Pentecost, there we go. Period number one would be the boyhood of Jesus from zero to 12 years. These include incidents and prophecies that led to His birth and the little information we have about His childhood. We don't have a lot of information in the Bible about His childhood. Now there have been a lot of books written about this time that show Jesus doing miracles. You know. Again, not in the Bible, but you know, whenever there's a lack of information, it seems that men have to, they feel it compelled to fill in the void. And so a lot of books were written supposedly about his boyhood. Some of them say just fantastic things, you know, like he was working with his father uh, Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph was a carpenter and once they had to build a table and uh, the board wasn't long enough for the table so Jesus miraculously stretched the board to make it long enough to create that table. This kind of fantastic uh, type of uh, writing you find in there. Or uh, some writers said he lived in the desert with the monks, the Essenians for example, uh, where he was trained. But these are, are, are fables, they're stories that were circulated about him in the very early uh, years of Christianity. The only information that God has revealed about his childhood is limited and contained in a few passages of Matthew and Luke, and we'll be looking at those when we start next week uh, you know, in chronological order. So first general period of his life, the boyhood, zero to 12 years of age. Second period, of his ministry or life uh, is the beginning uh, of his public ministry. At the age of 30, Jesus leaves his obscure life in Nazareth and Capernaum. Nazareth, uh, Nazareth is where he lived as a boy. Capernaum is where he lived as uh, an adult. This is in the northern region. And um, he travels south to begin his uh, public ministry in and around Jerusalem. And this debut, of course, is spectacular and it includes uh, his meeting with John the Baptist. We'll talk about that when we get to that part of his life. Third uh, session or period of his life uh, is the first Passover to the second Passover. Um, first Passover to the second. Most of the information for this period is found in the book of John. Uh, it does most of it, uh, most of his ministry uh, during this first Passover time uh, is in Jerusalem uh, and then he departs from, the, uh, from Jerusalem which is in the south of the country and returns home in the north. Fourth period of his life uh, would be the second Passover to the third Passover. Uh, 36 events make up this section where most of the action takes place in Galilee, the northern part of the country where Jesus 
originally grew up. So we, we're always assuming many times when we read the Bible that a lot of things are taking place in Jerusalem because that's the key city, but that's not so. Many, many of, uh, of the uh, incidents that we're going to look at take place uh, in Jesus' hometown and in and around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, fifth period would be the third Passover to the final week. Uh, this is the longest section in the New Testament. There are 61 events mentioned in this period and all four writers describe the, this period in detail. During this time we see Jesus going back and forth from the north, the northwest, to the southern capital of Jerusalem. I want to show you a little map here. There we go, if you can take a look at that. This is a map of Jesus' area of ministry and I just want to point out a few things that I want you to look at. First of all, Bethlehem is in the south. If you find Jerusalem, you can find Bethlehem is just south. Just go down one dot there and there's Bethlehem. That's where he was born, Nazareth is where he was raised. So if you go, just follow you know, between the, uh, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee at the top, if you go down towards the, uh, the left-hand side of the uh, screen, you'll see uh, Nazareth. Uh, that's where he was raised. Interesting thing, between um, um, Jerusalem and Nazareth, about 70 miles. So whenever they are saying he's going home and he comes back, you know, that's a trip of 70 miles. They didn't take the train, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't drive, ride on horseback, they walked it. They walked. And so a lot of Jesus' ministry uh, was walking. Uh, and it was during these walks, this up and down uh, between uh, Nazareth and, and the Sea of Galilee and Jerusalem, uh, where they camped, where they stayed in homes, where Jesus was teaching his um, his disciples during these travels. Uh, another city I want you to look at is Capernaum. And if you go to the Sea of Galilee in the north and just near the top of the Sea of Galilee, there is Capernaum where Jesus lived as an adult. Uh, there's also a synagogue there. It says on the, on the Sabbath he would go into the synagogue and teach in Capernaum. And if you go to Capernaum, uh, archeologists have found that uh, that synagogue have found, uh, obviously the walls are not there, but the base is still there, the doors are there, the floors, so on and so forth. It's quite an amazing thing to be walking into uh, the floor and the area where Jesus uh, taught. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, of course, lots of activity. Uh, most of the apostles were called, uh, they were fishermen in that sea, uh, and they crossed over it many times. Instead of walking around, they would take the boat to cross from one side to the other. Um, Cana, again, if you are at the Sea of Galilee and you go uh, just above Nazareth, there's the city of Canaan um, where the first miracle was done at the wedding, the turning of, um, of water into wine. Decapolis, um, if you again at the Sea of Galilee to the, a little at the bottom to the right, you'll see a whole region there called Decapolis. This is where the demoniac, Jesus heals that demoniac, the man possessed by many demons, the demoniac came from there, and Decapolis means 10 cities. There were 10 cities that were in that region, and they called the region Decapolis. Of course, Jerusalem, the capital city, you go all the way down, the Dead Sea to the left of the Dead Sea, Jerusalem is there, the capital city, that's where the temple was. No matter which way you came, north, south, east, west, no matter which way you approached Jerusalem, you would always say you were going up, to Jerusalem. You're never going down to Jerusalem or around to Jerusalem. You were always going up to Jerusalem. Uh, Bethany. Uh, Bethany is just, if you look at Jerusalem, go to the right slightly, there's Bethany, only a few miles from Jerusalem. That was the city uh, where Jesus would often stay overnight at the house of uh, Lazarus. Uh, Mary and Martha, they lived in Bethany and that was kind of Jesus' home base, if you wish, away from home when he was in Jerusalem, and then Samaria. Samaria is not a, just one place, it's a whole region, a region in between, if you want, uh, between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, there's a whole region there called Samaria. And it was a country that he had to go through in order to get to and from Galilee, and that's where he met the 
Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. We're going to talk about the Samaritans and some of their backgrounds a little later. So I wanted to show you that map to give you some of the stops along the way where Jesus carried out His ministry, walking to and fro with disciples, always accompanying Him on the road. Okay, let's go on now to number six, the sixth. Remember, these are not events that we're talking about today. The, uh, these things are periods in his life, the general periods of his life. We're going to break these down into many more events as we go on. So number six would be the last Passover week ending with the crucifixion. We're going to go through this section giving you the events day by day, almost hour by hour as they took place. We'll even give you some of the dates, some of the calendar dates, like what month and what day of the month certain things uh, took place. Now, according to our present day calendars, it would have been Sunday, for example, April the 2nd, to Saturday, April the 7th, his final day uh, in the tomb. And we're, as I say, when we get there, we'll talk about that. And then the final uh, period of his life, of course, the resurrection, his appearances, and the ascension. So aside from his ascension before the apostles, the Bible counts 10 separate appearances to more than 540 people in the space of 40 days. Quite significant proof of His resurrection. And we're going to go over these as we study. Well, hopefully at the end of our study, the ministry of Jesus, His life, His work, will become more real. Actually, that's my goal, to make it more real. Sometimes when we read things out of sequence, it's hard to realize that these things, these events actually happened. And you know, it, it was in the normal train of life. Uh, and when we see how one event you know, leads into another event, uh, the, each event will, as I say, gain more uh, perspective. Hopefully they'll be even more understandable as a historical event and not simply a, a, a string of teachings you know, that we read in four different gospel uh, books. Now each week also I'm going to try to focus in on some event or teaching to try to draw a lesson or a word of encouragement that we, can take, that we can take with us. So in this week's lesson, we've not looked at any particular event, but rather an overview of Jesus' movements and His work. But even from this, we can draw certain conclusions. Conclusion number one, there was a method. There was a method. You know, when you read the Gospels, you don't readily see the pattern of His movements, but there's, there's definitely a well laid plan here and you see it when you begin to look at these things in chronological order. For example, the early years at home in the north with his family and then the announcement of his ministry in the capital in the south where John was and the leaders were and the bulk of the population were situated and then a return to the north to actually begin his teaching and miracles for his own family, recruiting his own neighbors as disciples. Doesn't that make sense? We're always thinking, oh yeah, he went out and just looked at a stranger and said, okay, you, you come with me. You know, no, that's not the way it worked. The people he called as disciples were his neighbors, people who knew him growing up. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that, aren't those the first people? Let's say you're, 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 you're introducing a product or you're selling Avon. Or who, who are the first people are you, you're going to talk to? Now obviously I'm not comparing the gospel to Avon, but in the natural scheme of things, who are the first people you're going to, well, you're going to share the gospel with when you first are converted to Christ? Isn't it your mom or your brother or your cousin? Aren't they the people that you're going to talk to at the very beginning? Well, nothing is different here. Jesus calls His disciples. First disciples come from where? They come from, they're His cousins. They're people that He knows, people that live uh, near Him. And then once He has some, then there's a return to Jerusalem to expand His ministry. Once it's established, He's got some followers. He, people are beginning to talk about Him. He's, he's, he's beginning to teach them. So then He and they, where do they go? Well, they go to the big city. And they begin to explain and begin to expand the things that he's talking about. And then they spend uh, time in the north once again, and then the east and the west after being rejected and hunted by leaders in the capital. Again, it makes sense. He goes to the capital, he teaches, he does miracles, he gets, he gets not feedback, he gets blowback. You know, who are you? Who, who gave you the right to do these things? 
Who do you think you are? You better be careful. So what happens? Well, they go back north and they expand the ministry in, in the northern regions. And then his final appearance in Jerusalem, which resulted in his death and, and resurrection at the, at the very end. And then of course the church beginning in Jerusalem and spreading out. So there was, there was a method. North begins in the north, goes to the south. Every time there was problems or he was being hunted or there, you know, he was being pushed in by the leaders, he would go back north for a time and then let things cool in the city and then he'd come back and continue. There was a method to his ministry. Secondly, uh, his movements were based on ministry. His movements were based on ministry and prophecy. You know, the fact that he was born in Bethlehem and he was raised in Nazareth were not just coincidences. These, uh, these events were mentioned in the prophets. Uh, the fact that he was born in Bethlehem, for example, this was mentioned in Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter five, verse two. The fact that he lived and grew up in Nazareth. This, uh, you know, uh, uh, Matthew talks about this in chapter two, verse 23. So Jesus himself mentioned that he did the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit moved him to go into the desert to be tempted. He didn't go to Jerusalem until the time was fulfilled. In other words, he had an agenda. He had a, prof, a prophetic agenda to, to fill. It wasn't, how do I feel today? Well, maybe I'll do a miracle today. Now that's not the way that it worked. So we don't see mindless wandering, but rather a well-ordered ministry, time to be in certain places at certain periods, based on God's word and the prophets, and He will, during the period Jesus was physically on earth, God's will was being accomplished, and God's will according to what the prophets said would happen when the Messiah would come. So the point we need to remember was that um, uh, uh, the, the, his whole ministry was not based simply on random events, but all events that were carefully laid out in advance by God and spoken of by the prophets. And maybe one more um, lesson that we can draw from this. Um, uh, Jesus uh, worked in and existed in at that time in a very small area, but he had a tremendous impact on the world. You know, he covered a corridor roughly um, that, you know, the, the corridor between Galilee and Jerusalem, about a hundred miles. So if you go from, you know, uh, from Nazareth or from Cana or, or, or Capernaum down to Jerusalem, 70, 80 miles, and then if you go a little further north, a little further south, you've got about a hundred miles this way and maybe 60 miles between uh, the Mediterranean Sea and uh, uh, the River Jordan. A you know, very, very small area of land. But look at the impact over 2,000 years. So when we're thinking that you know, we can't do much for Christ from our little town or our small resources, remember how much came from how little in Jesus' ministry. If God directs our work and our, and our efforts, we can affect the whole world for Christ from right here uh, where we live and where we serve. Okay, so that's lesson one in the beginning of our series on the life of Jesus in chronological order. Uh, I hope that you'll read the passages to prepare for next week. That's one other thing. Um, uh, we won't have time to read all the scripture references and all the passages, so I encourage you to uh, I encourage you to read those in advance and be ready for our lesson. So thank you, we'll see you again starting lesson two.